Okay, hello everybody. Um, yeah, so welcome again. Uh, we found our way across to the Mary Ogilvy Lecture Theatre. Uh, well done for not walking across the grass. We'll tell off all those filming people for being on the grass, but we were the good people and didn't. So, uh, yes, my name is Keith Bell. I'm a co-director of UKIRK and have been chair of the organising committee of this conference, so it's my great pleasure to welcome you here. I think there may be a few people arriving at drifting in in the next kind of few minutes a minute, uh, as well. I understand there was a train was delayed, so we'll try not to be disturbed by other people arriving as well. But um, looking, I'm certainly looking forward to the next couple of days, a whole range of yeah, really interesting <laughs> topics that Jim will introduce in a few moments. But before we really get going properly, I just want to take this chance to, uh, well, firstly, say a couple of logistical things. So in the programme, uh, the kind of sessions that have got a light green background will be in this room. And the other sessions will be in a, uh, a seminar room that's just next to the reception desk. So a little bit of shuttling maybe between the two locations. Oh, here we go. Here's the people arriving on the late train. Um, so, uh, and then just a notice to uh, session chair people and presenters. If you could be in the right room at least 15 minutes before your session starts, please. Just make sure you meet each other and make sure all the, the presentations are uploaded and all that sort of thing. If you haven't sent your presentation through yet, uh, you can email it to Den. So his email address will be in, I think, on the, one of the first few pages of the program. And then he will pass it on to the local people here and get it all on the right machine at the right time. Other thing I want to do is just to say some thank yous, actually, with, uh, before we get going. So especially to uh, the organising committee who've helped to put this programme together. So if there's any imperfections in the programme, it's a collective responsibility, OK, folks? Looking at my fellow members of the organising <laughs> committee. So um, they are Patrick Olcon, Nicky Beaumont, Alan Collinson, Tim German, uh, Tom Nolan, Caroline Kazemko, Kaiser Lingeri, Carly McLachlan, Katie Rolich, Jim Watson and Jan Webb. So uh, we had an excellent meeting back in December to kind of sift through the proposals and come up with the programme that we now have. Uh, but special thanks, I think, as well to the people at Newkirk headquarters who've helped to put this together. So in particular, Den, Alison, Kaiser, David, and especially in the last month, all the kind of last-minute complications that arise when you try and organise any kind of event. Jessica, who you already have seen kind of fitting around, fixing things. So a special thanks to Jessica in particular for making this all hang together. And uh, hopefully you'll be completely glitch-free and you won't notice any of the panicking in the background and we'll have a, an excellent time. Uh, okay, so with that, I'll hand over to Jim. Thanks very much. Well, thank you uh, very much, Keith, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's really great to see so many people here, and I'm really delighted that uh, we're holding this event. Um, uh, it, it was oversubscribed, which hopefully tells you something about um, how sort of popular this uh, topic is. I wanted to also add my thanks to, uh, to Keith, and particularly to Keith for uh, uh, chairing the conference committee so ably. Um, he certainly introduced me to a whole new process for allocating papers to sessions, which involves some sort of market mechanism. So if you ever run a conference and want to know how to do this, um, it seemed to work. So uh, Keith is your man, and I'm sure he's got some very good day rates if anybody wants to hire him to do that. Um, UKIRK has just turned 15 years old. We're not going to sing or anything, but um, it's kind of gave me a bit of pause to think back 15 years uh, to 2004 and think about this particular agenda of local energy. Um, in 2004, I was involved in um, a couple of my first research projects on this. Uh, one was on a quaintly titled topic called microgeneration, which is now just generating energy in your house, um, uh, and basically concluded it was all too expensive and would never happen. And, um, well, you know how wrong that was. Um, but it's worth reflecting on what's changed since then. At that time, in the early 2000s, there was some activity on local energy, but it was really a few heroic individuals and organisations trying to work against a system which really wasn't designed for it, a very centralised energy system in all sorts of different ways. So you had some local authorities... Um, um, like Woking Borough Council, like Nottingham doing things, a few community energy projects, a few researchers working on it, and so on. Since then, we've had a huge amount of change. 
technical change, uh, technology costs have fallen. We've had policy change, which have driven those technology costs, and that's enabled a whole set of new actors to come into local energy, community groups, local authorities to develop their capabilities uh, and activities and so on. So there's been a real resurgence of bottom-up energy action. We've had at the same time rising concern about air quality, which has driven that, but only also the link to action on transport. Um, and we've seen an, what I think is an increasing opening up, certainly in the UK, of energy policy and decision-making at different scales. So we have historically been a very centralised uh, state and still are to many, uh, in many ways. But with devolution and with many local authorities now doing more, as we're going to hear from in a minute from Tom, um, I think decision-making and action on energy is now starting to become more of a multi-level affair and less about just what Westminster does. Um, and that's changed too. And then of course, very recently, we've had, you know, perhaps unexpectedly, or perhaps expectedly, a real resurgence on the front pages of climate change as a big issue with Extinction Rebellion, the school strikes, and so on. I thought we were going to be standing here in a conference bemoaning the fact that our favourite topic was getting absolutely no airtime because uh, people were distracted by something else. Um, but actually, you know, over the last few weeks, we've really had this resurgence of interest. And that means, you know, another good reason why it's a very good time to hold this meeting. So hopefully all of that means that it's, it's timely and I hope there are some good discussions and sessions and new contacts being made and new research ideas, but also talking about action, what people are actually doing. So we've deliberately invited not just researchers to this conference, but practitioners too, to talk about what's happening on the ground. Um, so I hope you all enjoy the two days and um, get uh, quite a lot out of it. Um, I don't think I've got many housekeeping things to add to what Keith said. The only thing I've been asked to just uh, point out is that there will be pictures and filming uh, throughout bits of the, uh, the couple of days we've got. We are live streaming some of the sessions too. If anybody's got any privacy concerns at all about that, please do have a word with Jessica or Den, um, because they're very happy to, um, you know, certainly when they're editing films later, to take people out of those if you are worried about any of that. So I now want to just... Um, uh, introduce our keynote speaker. I'm, I'm really, really pleased that we have a, a local uh, councillor um, with um, a lot of experience in, the, in this topic area to come and open the conference uh, properly. So Tom Hayes is a city councillor and cabinet member and a charity chief executive from Oxford City Council. His responsibility is community safety and the environment, so as usual, quite a broad brief. Responsibility for tackling air pollution, climate change, and uh, dangers to public safety. Um, things uh, including uh, launching the world's first zero emission zone in Oxford to tackle air pollution, developing, um, really interesting for us because we're going to be doing more work on this over the next couple of years, a citizens assembly to help set the, the journey to zero carbon and that's something that's increasingly being talked about in the context of the need to go even further than our targets right now. Uh, Finalising Oxford zero carbon journey and creating a new community safety partnership to tackle drugs. First elected as a councillor in 2014, re-elected in 2018, and Tom is also an NHS governor, a school governor, and sits on the Thames Valley's Police and Crime Panel, so a very, very uh, busy schedule. So I'm, I'm particularly uh, grateful that Tom was able to take time out to talk to us today. So over to you, Tom. Hello, um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, there's lots of friendly, there's lots of familiar faces here this morning um, and the turnout's pretty impressive and I'm not really surprised. Um, it's a really important topic to be discussing at a very timely moment. And I think the reference here to the climate emergencies that are being passed by local authorities around the country, including my own, and the reference to the climate strikes that we've seen, I think are really important. Because when you're in an emergency, it can be really tempting to conjure up images of car pileups, of you know, fast-paced action. But actually, what we also need, really significantly, is for all the information that we're generating to be turned into knowledge. For people to be coming together and thoughtfully reflecting on how we can best tackle the climate emergency. Maybe we could have done this a little bit sooner, but we're here now and let's get cracking. Uh, I think it's also great to be having a conference which brings together the collection of people who are here. So we've got researchers, practitioners, policy makers to all come together and look at local energy systems and to consider how best to exploit 
low carbon sources of energy and to manage and reduce energy demand. And you, know, you would expect me to say this as an Oxford councillor, but there's nowhere else better to do this. Uh, you, know, you have here in Oxford an unrivaled world-class city of knowledge, of research, of learning, and breakthrough innovation. Our universities, Oxford University and Oxford Brooks, are among the world's best, and they attract the world's top talent. Um, you know, one of the great things about being a councillor and uh, working um, on behalf of the City on Energy is that you can go into any meeting here in Oxford and you will be guaranteed to know probably 50% less than most people in that room. And that's a very humbling experience. And when you're a city council which is responsible for 1% of carbon emissions in the city and everything that you have to do in partnership, I think that's such an important mentality to be taking into those rooms. The council that I represent wants to do two things. It wants to ensure that all Oxford residents are able to benefit from the knowledge-based economy that we have thriving here in Oxford. But we also want to make sure that we can stave off the very worst effects of climate change and to exploit what opportunities that may be there as part of our journey to a zero carbon economy. We know that climate change isn't a future theoretical prospect. It's something which is here with us now. And we've been warned by scientists, many of them actually here in Oxford for a very long time, that things will get far worse if we don't act with much greater urgency. And we know the following three things to be, uh, to be self-evident and truth. Our planet is warming. It's been warming for a long time. More than half of the carbon we've been emitting into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels have been emitted in the past 25 years. I'm 35 years of age. Since I turned 10 years of age, our planet has burned more fossil fuels than in all the centuries before. The second truth is this. At a national political level, across all parties, there has been a refusal, even a fear, to reckon with the scale and the pace of climate change or the complete rethink in the way in which we run our economy that's needed. And three, there's been a failure of politics to do anything like what is necessary to fight climate change. Yes, we were the first country in the world to pass a climate change act 10 years ago. Yes, we have led the world as a country in reducing the carbon intensity of our economy over the past 40 years. Yes, we've made huge progress on plastics-free activity. Yes, last month, renewables contributed to over 40% of our electricity supply as a country. And in fact, just this last weekend, we had our longest ever period of no coal contributing to electricity generation in the UK. But there is a very important difference between doing nothing and not doing enough. And when you are a government or a council that is doing a lot, in your view, it can be sometimes challenging for you to face up to the fact that actually you are not doing enough. And setting ambition and working in partnership can be a tough thing to do. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The only credible answer of democratic politics in response to the protests that we're seeing out in the streets and the truths that I've just laid out is to admit that we all need to raise our game and show that we can act substantively. We know all these truths to be self-evident because we've got the best people teaching them to us. We've got school children teaching them to us. They're the people in the future who are going to be most affected by the decisions we take today. I am uh, 35 years of age. I will be the current age of the current Prime Minister in 2049. If you look at the leader of the opposition, if you look at the other party leaders, we have a huge generational gap between those people who are most going to be affected by the decisions taken today and the people taking the decisions. And that especially speaks to the need to have as many people involved in decision making we're confronted with the fierce urgency of now, is what Martin Luther King preached in 1967 in a lesser known sermon, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Change. He may as well have been speaking on climate change today. There are areas where my council needs government support. We can't just do it all on our own. Since 2010, local authorities have seen zero carbon homes scrapped by the coalition government and the following government, though they're coming back. The energy company obligation's solid wall programme lasted less than a year after it was announced. Tidal lagoons have been flirted with, but have gone nowhere. The carbon capture fund money was put up and taken away. Onshore wind just has effectively been banned. The Green Investment Bank, bank was set up, but it's already been sold off. We need to make our electricity grid 100% zero carbon before 2050. But there are also many areas where local councils can make progress. And that's by attracting millions of pounds of investment in low or zero carbon technologies, particularly from the private sector trialling new technologies and approaches and working with transportation, housing, energy and other providers to ensure our cities are striving for zero carbon. 
we do, as a city council, work closely with government. It's not every Valentine's Day that I spend it with the Environment Secretary, as happened this year. But I was with him having, you know, effectively a candlelit supper, <coughs> talking about what more he could do in order to clean up our air, but also to go further in generating local energy systems. Government is listening. We just need them to listen a little bit harder. And we need government support to make private finance work better. We'll talk, I'll talk more about that later. I want to talk here uh, for the majority of uh, the presentation about what we're doing in Oxford. And I want to speak from two perspectives. I want to speak from the perspective of a partner with the council firmly committed to the aspirations of carbon neutrality. I want to speak in a non-partisan way as a politician, giving political direction and guidance to what we're doing as a local authority in tandem with national government. And I think I particularly was very pleased yesterday when I was watching TV while preparing this presentation. Uh, and as you do when you're watching TV, you put on the BBC Parliament channel. And while watching the BBC Parliament channel and watching the Extinction Rebellion urban questions, urgent questions debate, to be listening to the Energy Minister, Claire Perry, who said, and I quote you, Oxford City Council is an example of excellence. <laughs> so I thought that was a good non-partisan way to start the presentation. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about our excellence. Um, we're tackling our carbon emissions from our estate and our operations. We're using our influence to work with partners across the city to reduce emissions further. And our city-wide carbon reduction initiatives are including the following. Driving down energy costs, which is so important for our fight against poverty. Reducing fuel, po fuel poverty. Improving air quality. And to that end, we have just, with Oxfordshire County Council, launched the world's first zero emission zone plans to come in from 2020. A really excellent example of partnership working. And enabling market uptake of new technologies, driving innovation in the local energy sector, and establishing Oxford as a leading city addressing climate change. We've been managing carbon emissions from our estate and our operations since 2008. We're currently delivering our third carbon management plan, running from 2017 to 2022. And this maps out how our 5% per year carbon reduction target will be achieved by continual improvement in energy management, driving down energy costs, fuel costs and water costs. It focuses on three things. It focuses on developing on-site generation, increasing energy efficiency and reducing fuel demand. In terms of on-site generation, our council has installed over one megawatt of solar PV across our estate. This generates the equivalent of 10% of our annual electricity from on-site generation and it avoids the use of over 800 megawatt hours of electricity being drawn from the national grid which helps to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 380 tonnes per year and saves the taxpayer over £100,000 of electricity spent per year. More solar PV installations are in development. Just next month, we've got a large 100 kilowatt hour solar carport installation scheduled for completion at our Lees Pool and Leisure Centre. The Council is also exploring scope for projects that combine large-scale solar PV, battery storage, electric vehicle charging, technologies in a smart system that maximises the economic and environmental benefits to Oxford, and I'll be going into some detail about that. And our knowledge learned is being passed on to local organisations in the city and the surrounding regions through our partnership networks and our initiatives. I'm really proud about the fact that the City Council has helped to create some of these networks and that we're at the heart of so many of them. In terms of, demanding, in terms of reducing demand and energy efficiency, my City Council has implemented a range of energy efficiency projects in our buildings through our carbon management programme including such things as boiler upgrades, insulation measures, swimming pool covers, and let me tell you, that is a controversial topic. Uh, motor I've still got the scars on my back. Uh, motor efficiency improvements, LED lightings and controls, and smart metering, monitoring systems to target excess consumption issues quickly. We've established our Salix Energy Efficiency Recycling Loans Fund, a 50-50 government-sponsored match fund for energy invest to save projects. We're using our Salix Fund to develop energy efficiency projects improvements, estimated to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by over 1,800 tonnes per year. And that's reducing our energy costs by over £400,000 per year. And we're currently developing energy management systems for all of our flagship buildings. And in terms of our citywide projects, Oxford City Council has been leading the way in reducing city, emissions, in city carbon emissions. As I said, we're responsible for just 1% of the city's CO2 emissions, and we're making excellent progress against our internal carbon reduction targets. But how, working in partnership, can we meet our ambitious citywide targets 
set a very long time ago in 2011 to reduce citywide emissions by 40% by 2020 on 2005 baselines? It's a good question. But actually, the better question is, how do we as a city get to zero carbon? How do we get to zero emissions? Just as we've got a zero emission zone, which is aimed to get polluting vehicles off our roads to improve public health and to, he to end health inequalities in our city and our county, because we know that air pollution disproportionately affects the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. How do we develop a plan as a city responsible for 1% of carbon emissions to get to zero carbon? How do we build on our strengths? And in this context, the City Council is leading on several pioneering partnership projects. And I just want to dwell a little bit on why we do that partnership beyond the reason that we're responsible for just 1% of emissions. It's actually in our DNA. One of the great things about the City Council, if you have any interaction with us, at the officer level in particular, is that we've got a very large sustainability team. And that's a team that has been prioritised in a time of quite significant financial squeeze. We've seen significant cuts over the last nine years. But the City Council has prioritised our sustainability team, has expanded our sustainability team, because we recognise that actually one of the best ways in which we can reduce our carbon footprint, meet our wider goals around inequality and poverty, but also more broadly be of greater service to the city and our partners, is by investing in that team. And it's because ours is actually a celebration of values. It's doing more, it's achieving more, it's learning more, it's working together, because we recognise that we don't have all the answers, but we need to be an enabler as a council to make sure that others can find some of those answers. And so to that end, we work with Low Carbon Oxford. And I'm just going to you know, point at Barbara here, um, waves in the air. Um, Barbara, who's you know, an absolute uh, titan of the local energy system here in Oxford. Um, and I'm really proud that Oxford City Council has played a role in developing Low Carbon Oxford, which Barbara is so intimately linked to. The council uh, leads the coordination of the Low Carbon Oxford network. Uh, it's, a local, it's a local collaborative of over 40 organisations that are responsible for over half of Oxford's carbon dioxide emissions and which have committed to reducing their emissions by 3% per year. We're proud to have been at the heart of the, uh, the network, providing the core funding and the resourcing. And the connections that have been made through that network have sparked the story about how the mini plant here in Oxford came to host one of the largest roof-mounted solar panel installations in the UK. The launch of Low Carbon Oxford was a call to action to reduce our carbon emissions, to develop a low carbon economy and to do it together. And the growth of that partnership has connected more of us, made possible more learning, shared more knowledge, and given rise to more innovations that we could hope that we could have achieved alone. It's helped us to make possible launches, such as the launch very recently that some of you may have, may have heard of, of Oxfordshire Green Tech. And at its very essence, Green Tech is about supporting Oxfordshire businesses and organisations to develop services and products that enable low-carbon, resilient, sustainable lifestyles. It's about promoting Oxfordshire as a centre for resili resilient growth and job creation. And although it's very much in its infancy, I'm very hopeful and expectant and confident that we'll be hearing a lot more about green tech. The Council is also participating in a multi-stakeholder partnership to grow Oxfordshire's low carbon economy through assisting SMEs to reduce their energy consumption and implement energy efficiency projects. We're passing on our expert knowledge in energy management best practice and through access to a range of expert networks to assist SMEs in driving down energy spend and associated carbon emissions. We're working on heat networks. We're leading a master planning exercise for heat networks here in Oxford, funded by uh, the Heat Networks Development Unit at Bayes. And we're working with the University of Oxford, Oxford Brookes University, and other partners to generate feasibility studies for heat networks in potential locations such as the city centre university sites, the science area, and the Headington Hospital area. And we're also working through Green Week to use culture, creativity and community to inspire local people to take action against climate change. Last year, we collaborated with seven partner organisations to offer over 100 events across the city. We engaged over 40,000 people at those events, including the Big Green Day Out in Oxford, which returns this year, if you're in the city, um, with over 25,000 attendees. And just looking over some of the plans for the Big Green Day Out this year, there's some really remarkable plans being laid out. We're accelerating electric vehicle adoption. The council's proactively working to accelerate the market with a range of infrastructure improvement projects, including some pretty impressive and world firsts. Go Ultra Low Oxford, an on-street charging project funded by, uh, the, to the tune of £800,000 for a residential EV charging scheme. It's in its first phase 
and it's delivered five different types of chargers, ranging from low technology pavement channels for safe stowage of cables during charging, slimline charging pillars, and lamp column integrated charging sockets. A further 100 will be rolled out by 2021. And when you, as a city, are doing some of these innovations, you have the eyes of the world on you. And so it was fantastic recently to have uh, a bit of a delegation from China come over to take a look at some of the work that we're doing around on-street charging and to talk through some of the challenges that we face. Um, and I may have put my foot in it slightly when I said that one of the challenges that we face is actually engaging our public in a democratic way, um, which didn't go down the very best. Um, um, but then we were able to hear from uh, the delegation about how actually they're able to accelerate their progress on a significant scale. So <laughs> um, it felt like it was a, it was a bit of a head-to-head there. <laughs> um, we're also proposing a Go Ultra Low Oxford taxi scheme. Uh, it's a £500,000 scheme to install 18 rapid and fast chargers for the exclusive and priority use of our taxi drivers, our black cab drivers in particular. And that's so important because our black cab drivers are such an important part of our economy. We have 107 black cabs licensed in the city. They're people who are earning. They're working. They can't afford to stop. They need to be able to make sure that if they're stopping to charge, they're doing it for the smallest amount of time. And so we've prioritised installing those charging points in areas of the city where taxi cab drivers especially need to access them. And we're also making sure that we're doing that in a way which is consistent with their ability to earn. We've got some really ambitious uh, regulations that are coming into force, requiring all of our black cabs to move from 100% diesel to 100% electric by 2025. And as a city council, we need to make sure that we're doing all we can to support our trade to make that very swift transition. And we're also developing Oxpops, which I know some of you will have heard of, a technology development trial to install six pop-up charges on residential streets in Oxford. And that too is particularly important because we know that in Oxford, in Oxford as across the country, we have a real disparity between those people who have driveways and those who don't. It's harder to actually install electric vehicle charging points. Um, um, sorry, it's harder to buy electric cars if you don't have easy access to electric vehicle charging points within your locality. And we want to make sure that in the purchasing of electric vehicles, we don't have a disparity opening up, opening up between the haves and the have-nots. And one great way that we can close that gap is by having on-street charging. And also by changing our local planning requirements. We now require larger developments to provide 20% of total energy from, non, from on-site renewables and low-carbon technology. Our new local plan, which is just uh, now with the inspector, will have more stringent requirements um, um, being introduced. And then, really, the two points that I want to dwell on the most are Local Energy Oxford, sure, Project Leo, <laughs> and the Energy Super Hub, uh, both of which were announced uh, in a spate of activity about two weeks ago, <coughs> which I think are really great examples of how the City Council can work with partners to bring in private finance and really accelerate our journey. It was really exciting two weeks ago to be able to announce two projects worth £81 million. You don't get to do that very often. Um, and the reception has been pretty fantastic. The first of those projects, Local Energy Oxfordshire, uh, will see Oxfordshire receive uh, £40 million uh, to trial a new smart local energy system or smart grid. The system will explore how the growth in renewables locally, electric vehicles, battery storage and demand-side response can be supported and help in reducing charges to consumers. The system is going to be balancing local demand with local supply in a real-world environment and helping to test markets, inform investment models and assess the benefits of flexibility to the energy system. It will demonstrate the potential for individuals and communities to finally become active participants in the energy systems of the future. The hope is that Project Leo will enable Oxfordshire-based social enterprise, the Low Carbon Hub, which I just talked about before, to grow its existing portfolio of 40-plus energy projects, bringing a further £16 million of community energy projects to the county. The Hub's work over the past eight years has demonstrated a commitment to building renewable energy projects across Oxfordshire with schools, businesses and communities, and we and they are excited for the project to take that work to the next level, working with excellent project partners who are expert in their field. Project LEO will enable the hub to further grow community-owned renewable energy in Oxfordshire, provide new investment opportunities for local people, and allow our communities to have more say in their energy choices. We're very lucky in Oxford to have the low-carbon hub, and we're ambitious to prove that they and we can meet our energy needs in a way that's good for people, that's good for planet, and help the projects take a big step in that journey. And by creating opportunities for local communities to trade the energy they generate and store it at a local level, 
Project LEO will show the potential for individuals, businesses and communities to collaborate in the creation of an energy system that's good for all. We're thrilled to be seeing this project enabling people to take back control of their energy. We're thrilled that Project LEO will return power to people so that we can generate clean energy for our own neighbourhoods. And we're pleased too that this has only been made possible by the fact that we received £13.8 million from the UK Research and Innovation um, Arm and that will be supported by £26 million of private funding from project partners. It's going to be led by Scottish and Southern Electric Networks in partnership with the City Council, University of Oxford, EDF Energy, Oxford Brooks University, the County Council, NUV, Low Carbon Hub, Open Utility and Origami Energy. And the second of the two big announcements that we made about two weeks ago is Energy Super Hub Oxford. We at the City Council helped to facilitate a £41 million <coughs> project to trial the world's largest hybrid energy storage system, support electric vehicle charging and low carbon heat networking. This will provide the power infrastructure needed to kickstart an electric vehicle revolution here in Oxford and support the city's plans to clean up our air and cut our carbon emissions to zero. When we announced this, I had to give an interview to one of the local news media, um, and I basically went through the spiel. I gave a pretty, what I thought was a pretty clear uh, rundown of what it was, and I thought the best description of it was given me, to me by the journalist who just basically looked at me. So it's a BBB. I was like, I don't know, what's that? Potentially. I'm not going to say that on, me, on the media without knowing. I said it's a big bloody battery. <laughs> and I think that is a really great way of describing it. <laughs> I'm not sure our partners would like me describing it that way, but it is a big bloody battery. Um, it's the world's largest hybrid battery system at 50 megawatts to store and resupply power to electricity supplies, suppliers. Spare capacity can be used to supply energy for the charging of EVs in Oxford, and it will enable cheaper power for residential properties by low carbon ground source heating. Direct cabling connection to a national grid, grid transmission substation will bypass the usual electric distribution network constraints, allowing the provision of high electrical capacity for ultra-fast and rapid EV charging. The project's a collaboration between Pivot Power, Habitat Energy, uh, Red Tea, Kenza, the University of Oxford, again, another occurrence of the university in our partnerships, and Oxford City Council. The expectation is that it will deliver uh, 20,000 tonnes of CO2 per, sa per year saving by 2021 and that's going to rise to 44,000 tonnes per year by 2032. And we'll be using some of our capital funding for the purchase of electric vehicles as part of the City Council's fleet transformation. In Oxford, we're um, quite innovative in having a social enterprise, Oxford Direct Services, um, which is wholly owned by the company, by the City Council, um, doing all of our direct works in the city. And as part of our fleet replacement programme, we've got ambitious targets to get ODS, Oxford Direct Services, to a fully electric fleet. By having this money coming into the city, we are going to make it possible for at least 30 of those vehicles to accelerate to electric within a very, very tight time frame. And that's going to make it possible for our city council fleet to be compliant with our zero emission zone. It's also going to make it possible for our city council to wear its values on our sleeve, to basically show that we do promote and care deeply about zero emissions. Again, because we need to be making sure that we support our local stakeholders, we've been making sure that this uh, investment is going to support our black cab drivers. So funding will also be utilised to work with the, our partner organisations to offer a trial before you buy programme to the Hackney Carriage Fleet so they can accelerate that transition to electric. And just last week we had the first black cab uh, that is electric come into the city. And when we asked him why was, it that you, why was it that you decided to make the transition, why did you make the upfront cost, his argument was twofold. Well, it's threefold. First of all, I care about my health. I care about my pastor's health and I care about the city's health. Second of all, you're doing a lot to support us. And then third of all, I want to be ahead of the game. I want to be innovative. I want to have the first electric cab on, our, on the streets. And I actually had a text exchange with him just this morning, and he's already said that he's getting bumper um, rides in his car, or because he is the first electric cab. So if you are going to get, take a cab to the station, and you see, <laughs> you see a cab which looks like uh, a Bentley, <laughs> it's huge, um, please do hail it down. Um, and please say that I said this as well, because uh, it might buy me some uh, goodwill from the trade. Um, and we're, as I was saying, uh, accelerating electric vehicle charging. To the west of the city in our park and ride, a really important part of our sustainable transport infrastructure, we're going to be providing 20 plus ultra rapid EV charging points. Now, to give you a sense of what uh, the charging time will be, it will be around 10 to 30 minutes. That's quite groundbreaking. 
that should help the City Council to really get to a point where the zero emission zone moves from something which is theoretical and ambitious and bold into being a very distinct practical reality. And we'll also be providing dedicated charging services to the Council and key businesses such as the bus companies uh, potentially to accelerate their own transmission to zero emission. Now, I know that I'm pretty fortunate to stand up here and speak on behalf of the City Council. Um, I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again. We're doing really good things. But we're only able to do that because we've got such a lucky uh, set of situations. We've got a rich ecosystem with knowledge-rich institutions nearby. We've got a county council that we can work closely and well with. We've got a social enterprise network that's strong. We've got a low-carbon hub, which is fantastic. We know here in Oxford that we're blessed. We also know that these projects demonstrate the benefits of local authorities working with government, um, particularly to leverage in private finance. And we know that other local authorities don't have that benefit. So what I would say, building on the experiences of Oxford City Council, to those in the room who may be representing or linked to government, is that where you can give us support, particularly in the local authority sector, is by helping us to build a business case, by helping us to get investor ready, by helping us to leverage in private finance and make sure that we're able to move our conceptual into practical. Is this really frustrating, people? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? <laughs> it's almost like you want me off stage. Okay. I'm just going to plow on. If it's too painful, can you just put your fingers in, the, in your ears and you'll look my mum, like my mum? Um, we know that we're lucky here. Uh, we know that we're leveraging in private finance and there are some really good conceptual proposals. I mean, there's one in particular I want to bring out, which I know we'll be talked to later, which is the Bristol City Leap Prospectus, which has got really great ambitions to move from conceptual to shovel ready. We just need to make sure that government can support us to attract in private finance. We understand that government can't have all of the money to, to make the investments that we need, but we do need greater support from government departments with crack teams who can support local authorities to move through the maze of um, developing business cases. And then I want to close by talking about how, as a local authority, we can't just get things done immediately. The reference that I made to the Chinese delegation earlier was perhaps uh, uh, you know, light-hearted, but it does make a very good point, which is that there are many in this room who want to see change go fast. We do too. But as a democratic authority, we need to make sure that the change that we bring about it has the democratic consent of the people who are involved. We need to recognise that the people who live in our cities are consumers. They're users of our um, electric vehicles and our electric vehicle charging points. They're citizens. They're energy citizens. They're people who need to be carried with us. They need to be brought into these discussions. And so to that end, I wanted to talk about uh, two things which now animate the City Council's work. The first is around the linking up of our zero carbon strategy with our inclusive growth strategy. And the second is around the proposals that we've announced on Earth Day just this week to have the first citizens assembly in the UK by a local authority to deal with climate change. <coughs> I said earlier that I was speaking both as a partner on behalf of the City Council but also as a politician giving direction to the City Council's carbon strategy. And in doing that, that involves mobilising people who frankly at the moment are not interested in and frankly may be put off by the climate strikes that we're seeing around the country and in the city, uh, in the capital in particular. There are people who want to go about their ordinary business and get to work, people who vote about climate as a fourth or fifth or perhaps never order priority, who judge politicians not on the basis of their climate policies but on the basis of whether they're able to put food on their tables, whether they're able to have a job that pays well and gives the children and their families a, a future that's uh, worth investing in. And I appreciate that that is frustrating to many in the energy system. Uh, I appreciate that's frustrating to a lot of environmental campaigners. But the way in which we change that is by bringing people with us. Um, too many people are sitting back and feeling that the world beyond us will figure this out without political pressure. Uh, I mean, I was, I was talking to somebody on the doorstep just this weekend who basically said, uh, we've heard the world's been warming for years. We've heard the planet's about to destroy for years. It's not happened. We keep hearing about deadlines, but actually deadlines keep being put off. And all you want to do is take us back to the dark ages. You want to make sure that actually we have a lower quality and standard of life. So how is a local authority, which is so closely in touch with our citizens, 
How, as public servants, can we work with the energy system, work with private finance, and work with all of our partners to not just transform our city to be zero carbon, but work with people to actually be part of that journey? And the two ways in which we can do that is by making sure that our drive as a city for zero carbon involves the transformation of our economies at the scale which is needed to stop the climate crisis. The City Council's emerging and maturing plan to put social value and the right kind of growth uh, economically at the centre of our efforts is very much linked up with our work around tackling climate change. We recognise that we're a very prosperous city, but there are very stark inequalities in our city. Just as there are very wealthy people and there are very uh, educated people in our city, we have council estates and we've got other pockets of the city which experience deep poverty and inequality. So how do we make sure that those people don't feel like the climate change measures that we're introducing are being done to them rather than with them, but actually making them absorb the cost, potentially, of some of those measures? How do we avoid the backlashes that we've seen in other parts of the world, particularly in France? And as well as providing sustainable goods and services, we as a council need to find ways to ensure they're both accessible and affordable to those on low incomes. The UN can warn that we face a climate catastrophe if we don't accelerate the rate of carbon abatement in the next 12 years, and they're right. We can't allow climate change uh, to go another 30 years, have another, 12, have another 30 years to pass by without coming up with solutions, but more of the same won't fix the problem. We have to break environmentalism out of the bubble of the traditional green community. And that's why I'm particularly pleased that this week we did announce that Citizens' Assembly, the first in the UK. Quite rightly, some people have asked us, I turn up to the ballot box, I vote on election day, you've got a Citizens' Assembly here in Oxford, it's the council, why do we need to have another one? But there's a very simple answer to that. And it's that we, we as councillors, struggling under austerity and with significant financial squeeze, recognising the challenge that we all face, will have to make some really hard decisions. We need to make sure that we've got a real representation of viewpoints that get heard, not, as I was saying, just a traditional green viewpoint. To give some examples, the cost of building zero carbon homes has plummeted, but it still involves an additional outlay. Should we be, as a, should, as a council, we be building more truly cheap homes or truly green homes? Our council housing needs to be retrofitted to become more energy efficient. But as anybody who's lived in a council house, as I did growing up, will know, when the council comes round knocking on your door to install energy efficiency measures, it can involve a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of bother. We need to make sure that we work with tenants in their time scale, um, not do things to them. And we also need to make sure that we do this in a way that's, uh, that, that is fully costed. <laughs> How do we fund this? And sadly, we can't shake magic money trees. I'm going to really project here. Sadly, we can't shake magic money trees. So if you want zero carbon measures, what measures as citizens would they want us to do less of, spend less on? Perhaps cut altogether. Would they want us to completely scrap our leisure programme? Would they want us to spend less on homelessness services? These are some of the challenges and choices that local authorities around the country are going to have to be taking. You've got the convergence of a greater, aware, greater awareness than ever before of the, of the uh, rampant cost of climate change. And you also have a greater awareness than ever before of the financial squeeze that we see in our public sector. So even more than ever, we need to be leveraging private finance. And we need to be making sure that private finance understands that any climate change measures that we introduce <coughs> here in the city cannot just be theoretical or academic or geared towards purely climate goals. They have to be geared towards social goals. We need to be making sure that climate measures don't exacerbate inequality or poverty. We need to be making sure that people in our city feel like the journey they're taking towards zero carbon is working for them. And we need to make sure that in this citizens' assembly, we're modelling something which is truly innovative, something truly participatory. Because I think when any of us look around the country at our politics in a non-partisan way, I think it's fair to say that we can tell that there are serious <coughs> problems. So how can we in Oxford model some re something really experimental, something which is changing um, at the conversation, which engages people in our democracy, and how can we provide an example which allows us to scale that up at a national level. And that's so possible here in Oxford because we do have, as so many other local authorities do around the country, have that cross-party support for, building, uh, for taking action on climate change. We don't have opposition parties saying to us, you know, you're not doing enough, uh, you're not working hard enough. Uh, and, the, and us responding by saying, look at all the things that we're doing, we're great in a defence. What we have are people coming together because there's a true understanding about the difficulties that we face. And we need national government to be doing more of the same. And that, I think, is because there's something very unique about the city. City governments tend to just want the best for their communities. 
Uh, we want the best to work by working with partners as long as they share that same goal. We're rising everywhere as cities. Human populations are concentrating in cities around the world. This is a world which is already in the making. It's happening without coordination. It's just happening very spontaneously. So are we potentially missing a trick by focusing so heavily on national government and the nation state? Are we potentially realizing, are we potentially needing to realize that actually more densely populated cities where actually the greatest carbon emissions happen are the places where the greatest reductions in carbon can also take place? Our future growth and improvements in standard of living must not come from any further worsening of the problem. In fact, the UK can and must do more to improve the global, the local and the national situation by moving away from a national defence of a record of doing something, even if, it isn't every, even if it isn't everything we can do. And in that vein, I wanted to close by quoting uh, that giant of words and thoughts, uh, Maya Angelis. We've seen significant raising of awareness around climate change, particularly through the protests. It's not just time for awareness raising, it's time for solutions. Uh, she didn't say this, by the way. Um, what she did say was, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. We know better, and it's time for the whole energy system to come together to do better. So let's do better. Excellent opening to our conference, not only talking about uh, the things you're doing, the projects, but also the process by which you're trying to engage the citizens and link climate action to prosperity, well-being, tackling inequality and everything else. I'm going to now hand straight over to Patrick Alcorn, who's going to chair the uh, plenary panel, and Tom is going to join that, so uh, hold your questions for Tom if you have some for a bit later. Patrick is the head of local energy at Bayes um, and is going to chair the panel on public sector leadership. Over to you, Patrick. <coughs> Thank you, and I am, as many of you know, um, completely unprepared for this, having had two weeks off, um, and woke, uh, woke up yesterday, checked my diary, and realised I needed to be in Oxford at 10 o'clock, living in Brighton. Um, so um, I have done a lot of thinking about this, um, but fortunately Tom has done such a good job in explaining absolutely everything that is possible that I don't need to say um, a large chunk of what I was going to say. Um, spent all that time on the train preparing. Um, but I think... I think I, what I would say, um, I'm not going to answer for government. Um, I think there are ministers um, and debates, and in fact, Claire Perry is in front of a select committee this morning talking about energy efficiency um, and household energy efficiency with my director, so I would hate to try and upstage them um, if you're tuned into Parliament TV. Um, we are making progress. Um, we now have... Uh, buildings missions, we now have industrial cluster missions, we have road to zero, uh, the industrial strategy and the clean growth strategy are there as a way of setting a template and a, uh, a, a background that tries to do what Tom described and take the debate out of um, it being green and clean and it being about future economic growth and about the way the country should develop. We have a 25-year environment strategy that, again, tries to do that, um, and we can debate in the pub at a later date um, how effective we think all these strategies are um, and just how much action follows through from them. What I would say is that from that clean growth strategy, I got um, some money uh, to create a local energy program, and so England has a local energy program uh, not a huge amount of money in the grand scheme of things, but we now have an energy strategy in every LEP. We now have um, a hub in every area that is leading some of that um, opportunity to do proper project uh, development at scale, aggregation, portfolioing um, those projects up so that we can attract commercial investment. One of the things I would caution is that commercial investment is great if there's a return. But we do know that there's quite a lot of this work, especially around retrofit, that is not all that attractive um, to commercial return. Um, hundreds of thousands of Victorian properties that will take £20,000 to retrofit to anywhere near band C or band B across England. Um, when you go up to some of the islands off Scotland where um, those houses are even older um, and probably less 
insulated than that. Um, but somebody decided to grade two list them, so they can't even have double glazing at the moment. So there are some really big institutional problems and, and cost problems that if we leave those to the end, will fall on the public sector. So how do we actually build a proper package that isn't just creaming off the commercial opportunities now, but brings those into area-based schemes or into packages for long-term investment rather than short-term gain. I would uh, suggest that um, we would love to give you the evidence base, but as you, Kirk, will tell you, and I'm sure um, that will get reflected later today, there isn't a huge amount of it out there. There are lots and lots of pockets of very good work, most of it not particularly well evaluated because the people who were doing it were doing it to get it done and then moved on to the next project. So most local authorities don't have an evaluation budget. They don't evaluate their projects. They get them done and move on to the next project. Um, we've even seen that with quite a lot of the central government uh, money that has gone into this uh, Green Deal communities and Green Deal um, home improvement funds, um, the health booster funds, lots of small projects Lots of good examples, lots of good attempts, very, very little real evaluation. Anecdotal meetings with the people who ran the projects, written up uh, and, and passed around internally more as a lessons learnt than as a <laughs> genuine evaluation. Indeed, Ukirk, I think, looked at 123 um, future energy systems uh, projects that have been done across the country and found that they could basically not tell us what any of them had achieved at a macro scale because the quality of the evaluation wasn't there. And that's not a criticism of anybody doing the projects because the projects are funded in a way that there is no money or time set aside for that evaluation. So we need to find a way to build that evidence base together. It is you in the local areas and it is you as the academics who have that opportunity. But please, can I make this uh, clear? This is a problem we need evidence for today, not in three years' time when you've done a nice longitudinal study and then you've had it peer-reviewed by 65 different people. Um, again, I love your rigour and your approach, but I kind of need to convince Treasury tomorrow um, that this money needs to be forthcoming. And so some of that academic rigour we need to look at the 80-20 rule. We need to look at what we can do to build this evidence base quicker, how we can scale up, look at um, macro studies of some of the uh, very small uh, work that's been, uh, that has gone on and whether we can get better um, examples out of that, um, better evidence out of that. There is a lot of interest. Uh, Tom has talked very... Uh, clearly about what is happening here and uh, David's going to join us in a minute about, uh, to talk about Bristol but just yesterday uh, Glasgow released a very comprehensive um, review of their carbon emissions and what they need to do and, and a programme to do that. Manchester has used the Scatter Project to do similar things and if Carly's here she can tell you all about that because she helped do that for us or with them. Um, so I think there is a, a real opportunity but all of this is really focused on what local authorities can do. And the idea of this session was to look more broadly at the role of public sector and public sector leadership beyond just the local authorities. And it's great to hear that Tom spends all that time um, as a governor um, working with the NHS, working with the police commission, because it's those services as well that can provide anchor loads and opportunities in the hearts of communities to really make a difference. And those are the parts of the public sector that I think we need to talk about, not just the local authority. Um, to that end, we have just commissioned um, Carbon Literacy, which is a community um, interest company in Manchester. Uh, Manchester, as part of their Great Green Summit, pledged to be the first carbon literate city. Um, and they've done some training. Carbon Literacy is a training course for uh, senior decision makers and staff, so you can do it for any level of your organisation. Um, and they are going to develop a training pack for us, for universities, for uh, blue light services, for local government, for the NHS and for central government. 
Um, I would like to say that Bayes will be a carbon literate organization. <coughs> Some of you may say it should already be. Um, but we are working on that with, um, with the carbon literacy team up in Manchester to try and pull that together. Um, so, without going on forever, with all the wonderful things that my team of four people do, um, in the grand scale of three and a half thousand people, most of them now working on Brexit, um, it, is, it is a really interesting challenge. Um, but I'd like to invite uh, David White, um, who has come up from Bristol uh, and is going to join us and, and talk a little bit about um, what they're doing down in Bristol and City Leap. Uh, Emma, uh, um, Emma Bridge from uh, Community Energy England, which has been um, trying to coordinate and lead and disseminate um, for community energy groups across the country and bring them together but she seems to spend more time writing uh, consultation responses at the moment as we keep changing the rules. Um, and I can have that debate over coffee, but not in a place that's minuted. Um, and Sarah, I think... Ah, there you are. Sorry, looking straight at you, straight through you. And Sarah from Oxford um, is going to come and talk about some of the work that she's doing here as well. So if you can come and join me on the stage. I'm not sure if I need the mic or the mic or quite where I'm talking to, so... I'll stand still. Um, are you all right doing five minutes each from seated, or do you have slides and... Oh, I need to track some slides. <coughs> right, okay. There you go. So, um, let's... I have no movement. How do I get movement? Uh, Patrick, do you want one of us to go whilst you're figuring that out? Well, yes. Or? Emma, do you want to go first? And David, we'll get David's slides up. So, sure. Emma, take... Just, yep, go. <laughs> okay. we, want, we want to make this open and, uh, and as <laughs> inclusive as possible. So, let's, let's multitask. Okay, great. Five minutes. Um, so, we've heard a lot this morning about decarbonisation, tackling inequality, resilience, sustainability. If we are going to develop local energy systems that tackle all of those things, we really do need to work in partnership and we all need to show leadership. And by we, I mean communities, um, academics, researchers, public sector, private sector, civil servants, politicians. We all have a role in that. At Community Energy England, our primary focus is to support the growth of community energy. That's a part of local energy that has additional emphasis on community leadership, trust, local ownership, accountability, and benefit, essentially putting people at the heart of the energy system. Where public sector bodies, <coughs> in particular, collaborate, support, and invest in community energy, there are clear, significant, and lasting positive changes that not only benefit the community energy organization and the local authority or the public sector bodies, but also the local economy, society, and environment. The outlook for the energy sector is both challenging and exciting. Within the public sector, there have been diminishing budgets and resources, lots of cuts going on, but despite that, these bodies still have the scale, credibility, and administrative skill to support <coughs> the drive, innovation, and operate opportunities exhibited by community energy groups. And together, they can face and overcome some of those challenges, barriers, and indeed opportunities together. The public sector bodies can be the supporter, the investor, advocate for community energy as part of the wider local energy system. From inception to instalment, and onwards to the realization of all the additional social, economic, and environmental benefits that come from community-led energy. Public sector bodies can mentor, support, and advise, remove blockages, establish new partnerships and links, fund and invest, implement positive policies, and open their doors to help ensure the success of community energy. There's lots of opportunities there for them to get involved. There's also so many excellent examples out there. We've heard from Oxford, we're gonna hear from Bristol, there are plenty of others, but there are also a lot of bad examples out there. So we need to make sure that we share the learning and knowledge from all the good examples, which is why these two days are so important to the growth of local energy. 
Regardless of the cuts to, to subsidies and support mechanisms, there is no doubt that the energy transition will continue. And through working with the community sector, the public sector can and should play an important role in <coughs> ensuring that the transition to local energy systems deliver powerful, positive social, environmental and local economic impacts. Let's continue to work together to put people at the heart of the energy system and ensure that we do deliver a truly decentralised, decarbonised and fair energy system. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And uh, some interesting questions there about skills, which um, I think we'll come back to, um, and how local authorities and communities can share some of that skill um, and resource <coughs> that's available. David, would you like to use your crux? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> turbines to heat networks to solar PV to energy efficiency and so on and so forth. We are quite separate from Bristol Energy, our wholly owned energy supplier. But I'll come on to a bit of that. Um, <coughs> unsurprisingly for a city, energy is hugely significant to us. Um, we lose about close on a billion pounds of GVA out of the city every year through paying our energy bill. Uh, 60,000 of my fellow Bristolians are living in fuel poverty and they rely heavily on our services uh, and still despite much good progress we're still emitting 1.6 million tonnes of carbon a year and as has just been referenced we now have the revolution that is now taking place in the energy system as we move to that decentralised system and that opens up massive opportunities for us both as a local authority in our community energy groups and the city as a whole and that's around local generation tariffs, peer-to-peer -peer trading, energy services, flexibility markets, and lots of new different revenue streams that allow us to capture much more value in the city, if we take advantage of them. And so we do have a really key role in taking the lead around that leadership and innovation. We, alongside Oxford and many other city councils, and lots of innovation projects over the years, we now need to get on and do, the, do it for real. And we have the assets, we have our social housing properties, our corporate estates, our commercial property portfolios. We have the opportunity to leverage those assets to drive city-wide action. So, without wishing to do a compare and contrast, we've done lots of stuff too. Built wind turbines, solar farms, and it's great to hear about everything that Oxford's done as well. Our colleagues in Manchester and Newcastle and Nottingham all have done some really great things. But it's not enough. So although we are on target at the moment for 2050, setting 2030 climate emergency aside for one moment, most of that, two-thirds of it, is driven by grid decarbonisation and some building energy efficiency. We will not stay on track at the current rate of progress. Low-hanging fruit, kind of gone. And yet, a very large proportion of our residents across all wards, less well-off ones, richer ones, all really concerned about climate change. So we have the mandate to do something about it. And that is, and this is a slide we wrote a year ago, <laughs> not especially for this conference, about working in partnerships. So we face the same challenges as everybody else about shrinking budgets. We have to seriously up that pace and we really need our residents and communities engaged in that process. Crucially, they need some ownership. That is what decentralisation is about. So we want to build on our unique energy ecosystem to drive that significant change. Which leads me to City Leap. An idea of three years in the gestation, um, and we launched it last year. So the aim here is to create that future low-carbon interconnected energy system. We talk about a billion pounds over 10 years. They're really nice round numbers to hang hooks off. Hopefully it's going to be loads more than that, and it'll be over a much longer period of time. But it's leveraging off what we can bring to drive far wider action, much the same way as Oxford. We own a very small amount of the assets in the city. We need lots of other actors to play their part. <coughs> we also want to capture all of those social, environmental, and economic benefits in the city as well. A really key aspect, let's reduce that 870 million going out of the city. 
So we published this document last year. If you haven't seen it, it's on our website still, Energy Service Bristol. About 30 pages, very high level, talks about the pipeline of work that we are doing as an energy service and future opportunities that we could make available. <coughs> so that went out in May, closed an expression of interest window at the end of August. No idea what we were going to get back, if anything. And we got 181 expressions of interest. Last week, the last week of it, it doubled. We were just watching them pop in every half an hour or so. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, we've got to meet all of these organisations, and we have. Bar the contractors, because there's nothing to bid on at the moment in terms of a tender. And as you can see from the analysis in the middle there, a really broad range of responses, all the way from institutional financial investors to uh, major energy companies to a lot of really tech-smart companies, which was great to see. And really importantly, our community energy groups were able to respond. And we designed it to enable them to do that. It was two sides max of text. Don't want 30 page proposals, want two sides, just want to have a conversation. It's a soft market test. And that interest was across the piece. You know, energy efficiency has dived off a cliff, as we know, in recent years had the most interest, which was really interesting to see, some very interesting proposals around that. And so what we've been doing for the last six months or so is doing our own options appraisal, coming back, having heard what the markets had to say. So, two weeks ago, Cabinet approved our plan. So we are now going to go ahead and set up a joint venture with a strategic partner that we need to go out and procure, which will take some time. And that will form the core of City Lead, the cornerstone, the foundation stone, whichever analogy you wish to use. But it's just the start of the journey. You know, we probably want them to bring quite a lot of money, delivery capability if they have it, that's fine, that's great. But we definitely want lots of money. But then it needs to be much broader in terms of actors. It needs to be flexible. It needs to be innovative. We had a few companies say that they could do all of City Leap. No, you can't. And even if you could today, you won't be able to in five years' time. So you have to allow innovation and you have to allow local involvement. So it's going to be a very interesting tender exercise. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, David. And, and I think um, the issue there around mandate um, and, and procurement uh, some of the things that central government are renowned for doing best, um, and one of the reasons why uh, this discussion is so important is that actually trying to solve this with those as, as key barriers from a central nationalist perspective is going to be a really tough thing to do. So how do you do that but do it equally? Um, and to Emma's point, you know, I'm not sure I'd go as far as saying there are some bad examples. I think that we'd say there are some laggards who haven't quite um, started on this journey yet, but... Um, so, Sarah, do you have slides? Excellent. That makes the tech so much easier. Okay. Off you go. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name's Sarah Gilbert. Um, I'm the Energy Strategy Manager at Oxfordshire County Council. Um, Tom sort of talked very eloquently about the landscape um, in Oxford, um, and much of that applies uh, to Oxfordshire as a whole. But I just want to pick up on a couple of things. So um, I want to talk about the drivers um, for the County Council's involvement in local energy systems, um, a bit more about our internal leadership uh, on our estate, um, and I'll also talk about uh, the county's uh, role in the LEO project and our interest in that. Uh, so Tom sort of set out very well um, the way the status quo of the system impacts uh, our residents' lives presently um, in terms of poor air quality. And that's not just in the city. There's 13 air quality management areas um, across the county. Um, Tom also touched on fuel poverty, which affects one in ten of our households in Oxfordshire. Um, but the other area of risk for us uh, as a county council is how the constrained grid will affect our service delivery. Um, you might be aware that Oxfordshire has um, large-scale plans for growth in the county, 100,000 new homes by 2030. Um, and that grid constraint really affects our ability either to deliver those homes or certainly to deliver those homes in a sustainable manner. Um, our transport strategies, um, we, are, we have responsibilities council um, for transport strategy. 
um, have an element of improving air quality through the electrification of transport. Um, it's very clear to us that the ability to deliver that strategy will hinge on the ability of the grid to accommodate the charging infrastructure at a street by street level um, up to a county level. Um, so hence our interest in taking part um, in this area of work because of uh, the risk to us. Uh, but we also see a huge opportunity economically for Oxfordshire um, in trying to take part in this transition to a local energy system. Um, it may have been discussed before at this conference, but um, in 2014 we part-funded a study uh, by the Environmental Change Institute uh, looking at the business case for investment in the low-carbon transition specific to Oxfordshire. Um, and it had some quite compelling figures that still remain very influential uh, when we're talking to our members um, about our uh, activity in this area. Uh, 1.1 billion pounds um, of money flowing out of the county each year in importing fossil fuel derived energy. Um, what's the opportunity for us to start to um, uh, feel the benefit of that investment within the county through a more localised energy system? Uh, the potential for high ambition on decarbonisation to deliver 11,000 new jobs in Oxfordshire by 2030. Um, and Tom's already spoken about um, the fact that actually we've got a unique mix of ingredients in the county um, that make us very, very well positioned to lead in this area. So where does the County Council have a role? Um, everyone's emphasised the collective <laughs> nature of the energy challenge. Um, but we're very much, although we have no statutory responsibility for carbon or energy, um, similar to, to all local authorities, uh, we're very much, our statutory services are very much embedded within the energy system. So we have opportunities to influence through policy. Um, Tom's mentioned the zero emission zone as a really important um, area of work in setting the um, ambition and leadership for what we want to achieve in the city. Um, we also have um, opportunities through infrastructure provision um, and through partnership working. So I just want to talk a bit about our own estate. Um, Similarly to the city and also to many other large organisations, uh, we've worked very consistently uh, to try to deliver carbon reduction on our estate uh, through buildings investments, through a transition to electric vehicles. Uh, we've averaged about a 7% reduction to date, uh, and we've been supported, obviously, by decarbonisation of the grid, as, as David has mentioned. Um, we've committed to a major investment in street lighting, um, and that will further reduce our footprint by 25%. But we're now coming into a new phase of ambition on decarbonisation, um, and that's twofold. Um, driven by the urgency in the IPCC report, uh, the Council last month committed to make our operations in our estate carbon neutral by 2030. Um, that's a huge new ambition for us, um, and it will require a total step change, I think, in how we approach carbon reduction, um, and our need to really embed that into all our organisational practices. Um, it will also require us to look at new business models to deliver the offset required to get to net zero. Uh, but what it does is set a really strong signal about the direction of travel of our organisation uh, to our own staff, to our residents, uh, and particularly to our supply chains. Uh, similarly to Tom, the emissions on our estate only account for 1% of the county-wide emissions. Um, so the other thing we really want to achieve, and we're committed to achieve from our own estate, is taking a living lab approach. So where possible, ensuring the activity um, we take on our estate through our infrastructure can yield wider benefits within the county. Um, and uh, recognising our commitments that the county have seed funded um, an innovation team specifically focused on this goal of realising the benefits of disruptive technology for both the county council, um, and, the council um, and the wider county. Um, and the role of that team is to work with academia and industry um, to develop partnerships. So a few examples of that. Um, our £40 million investment in street lighting uh, will replace um, ageing lights, um, it will replace columns, um, and it's a, you know, it's a great investment in itself. It will reduce our energy spend by over 70%, so there's a business case that stacks up. Um, but as part of that investment, we'll also introduce a centralised management system, um, which someone described to me, it's a good way of describing it, as a remote control from our street lights. So we'll have much more flexibility about how we deliver lighting for residents. Um, what we're really focused on letting in that contract is not just how we can deliver those benefits, but how we can use the communication system that underpins the CMS um, to deliver our smart city ambitions. So we're looking for a real partnership approach 
um, with a provider who can help us to develop um, applications that will support decarbonisation of transport across the county, um, but also an open enough system that will allow um, other startups within the county to um, test out uh, their new technology on our network. Um, we're very, very involved in autonomous vehicles uh, and how the, our streetscape um, and our infrastructure will need to adapt to accommodate these. We're aware they're coming anyway, um, but we have an interest in involvement because we want to um, ensure that, again, we yield the best benefits for the county. Um, Tom mentioned Go Ultra Low. Um, we're involved in that uh, project uh, to provide charging uh, for residents who have no off-street parking. Um, we're particularly interested in whether street lighting has a role there. Um, we're making a significant infrastructure investment um, and it will be interesting to see what the findings of that study uh, finally generate uh, so that we can plan that into our delivery. Um, I'm also going to mention our work with Low Carbon Hub um, and emphasise that we are incredibly lucky to have them within the county um, and they challenge us to do more and to do better in the best possible way. Um, we work with them on our school's estate. Um, they've just delivered the 20th solar array um, and also work across our academies. Um, what they bring to us is the funding and the expertise. Uh, we bring uh, the ability to make legal agreements uh, and the promotion to schools. Uh, and we hope we'll continue to have a kind of long and fruitful relationship with Low Carbon Hub. I was going to touch on partnership working. Um, I don't think I'm going to sort of put too much more emphasis on it. Um, we are absolutely blessed to have such a long track record of genuinely successful partnership working. Most recently, we have um, worked on a countywide energy strategy led by the LEP with key uh, local stakeholders. Uh, and one of the things we're working hard for is for the legacy of that project to be a more formalised partnership on energy. Um, across the county, so moving beyond the partnerships we've created around individual projects um, to something with a more durable sort of whole systems um, look at our approach. Um, Project LEO, um, again, has been discussed. Um, we're very excited about that as the step in really realising some of those benefits of the low carbon economy report I spoke about earlier. Um, we're going to bring to that project our assets, closed landfill sites, park and rides, um, and we want to demonstrate how a smart approach to supply and demand can enable generation and storage in a post-fit world. Um, and as part of that project, um, alongside the universities, we'll be developing a local energy master planning tool um, to identify potential for demand reduction, heat networks and smart grids. Um, and the insights provided from that will take <coughs> back to inform investment policies, infrastructure planning. Um, I think I'll close there. I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about Leo from stakeholders talking later in the conference. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Tom, do you want to add anything? Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, can people hear me? Yes. Okay, good. That's fixed. Um, if I can just add a few quick points which responds to what people have said, that'd be great. I think the first is around mandate. I know I spent a lot of time talking around the Citizens' Assembly and the need to take people with us. But actually, what happens if the Citizens' Assembly says to us that they don't want us to go far and fast? What happens if they say to us they want us to go further and faster? <laughs> the whole point here is that we want to genuinely find out what people have to say because we'll understand the level of education and awareness around these issues. But the hope there is that we'll have some level of democratic consent and a mandate for doing what we want to do. Um, and I think that's particularly important. But we also need to bear in mind that if we do have people come into us saying, let's go further, let's go faster, and let's do that at the expense of some of the things that they traditionally see a council spending money on, that raises really serious questions for us as a council and our interaction with government. And I, I think government, you know, will hopefully be very aware of that. <coughs> um, I think the second thing that I want to talk about is um, the relationship between my local authority and other local authorities and government. So I dwell specifically on how it would be great to have, you know, a team of crack experts, I'll rephrase that, a crack team of experts <laughs> who are based... <laughs> <laughs> who are, um, who are um, uh, I've never come back here, am I? Who are based um, within, you know, key government departments um, who can help um, local authorities to navigate the, the maze of securing private finance. I think it's also, um, having said that we don't expect government and taxpayers to spend all of the money fixing all of our problems to dwell on the use of the public money. 
So it's great that we've got public money coming in in order to you know, seed developments like Project LEO and the Energy Super Hub to really facilitate that, um, that extra financial investment by the private sector. But I think it's also worth dwelling on the fact that in Oxford, we've been really, in Oxfordshire, we've been really fortunate at bringing government money in to do things like um, you know, the electrification of our buses. So we've got the first five electric buses rolling out in our streets fairly soon. Retrofitting 78 buses um, um, to a Euro 6 engine, although we've just now got extra money, which means a further 37 will go to a Euro <coughs> 6 engine. Um, and also the money that we've got for um, installing electric vehicle charging points, really funded by government. And they, you know, we really need to be applauding government for making that investment. But equally, we need to be thinking about the, the end point of the tail which is, it's great to have the seeding of all of this greening of electricity, great to have these electric buses, but actually we need to have more bus routes. We need to have more connectivity. We need to have buses that are affordable. There's no point having a green bus if nobody's sitting on it. Um, and so we need to be having government support for that. And then the final points I'll make are, we had uh, a delegation, um, as I was saying, from China come in. We also, not to boast about this, had a delegation from Nottingham. Um, you know, so we're, we're really reaching everybody. Um, they came to look at our, our, case, our, um, our electric vehicle charging points through our gullies, um, which was about as, as kind of local council as you can possibly get. Um, um, but it's about the exchange of knowledge. If we look out to where the greatest um, strides forward are being made in electrification, it's China. You know, we're seeing significant city measures which are causing electrification of vehicles, which mean that the electric vehicle market is growing and we're directly benefiting. But how can we actually exchange some of our knowledge with other countries? How can we do that as a local authority system, not just at a national government level? And I think the final thing I'd want to point out is, is a point that was picked up on around autonomous. We, know, we think we know what's happening in the outside world. We think we've got a handle on it. We don't have a handle on it. You know, autonomous, shared, connected, digital, the list is gonna grow. There are things happening in the outside world which we'll only, as a local authority, get to, to hear about, actually, in about a year or two, by which point it might have overtaken our capacity to respond to it and serve our citizens. So how can we actually be programmed into our DNA to be outward looking, not just to the investment opportunities, but to the technological changes that are happening? And the big thing that I, you know, I would go back to is the point I made around the gap in age between those people making our decisions at a national level and those people who are going to be affected by the decisions. You know, the people who are piloting big technological change and startups are people who are millennials. They're people who have got a sharing economy, a culture. They're not used to buying things, they're used to sharing. So how can we be bringing those people into our conversations as well as having a democratic consent conferred through a citizens' assembly? Thank you very much. We've got about 15, maybe 20 minutes if we stretch it, depending on uh, Jim and Keith, um, for questions. And there is a mic up at the back. So... Um, oh, and another one there. So we start with one here and then one in the middle row there. We'll take them in twos or threes so that um, the panel uh, can have a chance to think about their answers. Um, and even though I'm chair, I may pontificate from occasion. Um, but that's just my nature. I'm sorry. So uh, Hi, can you say Emma. name and where you're from, please? Yeah. Emma Jones from CAG Consultants. We've heard some fantastically inspiring examples of how local government can be transformative in helping with this transition to local energy. Uh, but probably if you had a league table of the countries, I can't remember how many there are now, 400 or so local governments, local authorities, we've got three of the top five probably sitting on the stage. And, and referring to Patrick's reference to the 80-20 <coughs> rule, we need, well, ideally all local authorities to be taking this sort of public sector leadership role uh, well, certainly 80% of them, and probably at the moment you've got less than 10%. So how, in terms of local authority cuts, etc., how do we ensure that this can be rolled out to others? Wow, what a start. Uh, there's a gentleman in the row behind. Yes, OK. Uh, it's probably a question directed at David. Um, I'd also like to share that kind of commendation of the leadership you guys are showing. I think uh, the story you've just presented is uh, a great one. Interested specifically, and I know this is your counterpart at uh, Bristol Energy Company, but the, uh, the energy service offering, uh, heat as a service offering, that I know Bristol are just rolling out. <coughs> um, wonder if you could tell us any more about that. Really interested. Uh, it's kind of in your job title, so I just want to be cheeky and see if you can... Tell us a bit more, thanks. Can you pass that down? And one last one for now. 
Uh, hi, David Arms from Warwick Business School. Can I just ask about carbon neutral? Um, I heard Oxfordshire as a county saying they were setting themselves a target. Uh, just comments from the panel about what targets they feel they're setting, by when, and what do you think is going to make it happen? Right, who wants to go first with that lot? Go on, David. You answer your question explicitly. <laughs> well, you got you were name checked. So. Um, heat to the surface. Well, there's lots of different energy services for a start. So, um, if I talk about heat to the service the trial that Bristol Energy is running at the moment, that's fundamentally to. It could be a potential game changer. At the moment, your um, interests as a customer of an energy company are diametrically opposed to theirs. You want to use as little as possible to achieve a warm, comfortable home. They want you to use as much as possible for the obvious reasons. So with heat as a service, you basically buy warm hours. So I have a contract with my energy company. They will provide me with 12 warm hours a day, <coughs> which they guarantee that my home will be above an agreed temperature, uh, subject to a fair use limit to stop you opening the window and just letting all the excess heat out. Um, at that point, the energy company wants you to use as little energy as possible, and it actually could potentially mean they're incentivized to come and install energy efficiency measures in your home, because it makes economic sense for them to do so. So that's what heat energy heat as a service is a trial for, um, to see how acceptable that is to people, because it's a completely different concept to the way we buy power and gas today. Um, but it could be extended to electricity as well. Um, that's a possibility. Um, but, I mean, energy services as a, as a term is way broader than that because that's essentially providing all services that you might can pretty much think of in an energy context. So if you took a combined heat and power plant, that's supplying it with gas, taking the heat out the other end, selling it to somebody, doing the metering and billing, uh, providing flexibility into the market if you've got control of the CA. That's where they're all services. And those are, that is the future energy system that we start talking about when we talk about City Leap. We want to be able to control those assets to access those revenue streams. And that can get down to the home now. So we wear of aggregators that go down to two kilowatts. That's appliances in the home, pretty much. So that's a really interesting and a well, fair way off, I will admit. But you can actually sort of, we talk in the um, prospectus about the idea of Bristol battery going back to the BBB, actually, because it is sort of that, but it's also about demand-side response, because you need to be able to flex a lot in the future energy world. So can you turn demand down? Can you use, turn generation up when you want to? And all those sorts of things about balancing out that curve that we have at the moment in terms of electricity. That's the key. Okay, so who wants to talk about... Um targets, what they mean, and when we can actually get to them. Um, we've, we talk about carbon neutral, and then we talk about net zero, and we talk about offsetting, and it all gets very confusing trying to sit in Whitehall and say what actually equals what. So, um, Tom, some views? Yeah, I think, if I can take this one, because I think I'm the only uh, political person on, uh, on the panel, um, I'm taking a lot of political pressure right now, um, because I won't set a target date. Um, and I just won't do that for two reasons. First of all, I need the Citizens' Assembly to conclude, and I'm going to respect the will of the people who are a representation of viewpoints in the city. Uh, I'm, I don't want to be forced into making a declaration um, by a smaller minority in the city. But <coughs> second of all, there is nothing which will demoralise people and destroy trust um, in our ability as a council or public servants to tackle climate change than setting goals we cannot achieve. And I recognise entirely that people will say, well, the planet's burning, we're all going to be off the face of the planet in 12 years' time, so just set the target. Actually, that's not what the IPCC report says anyway. But second of all, setting targets, which are populist uh, gestures, is deeply unhelpful. And um, uh, if you're thinking about petitioning your local authority <laughs> to set a target, um, please do add the caveat um, <laughs> within resource constraint, um, <laughs> which isn't the sexiest thing to say, but it's really important. Um, because, you know, there are people in the city who need to be uh, carried along with us to nudge their own behaviours. The council can't fix all the problems. People need to change their behaviours. We have to facilitate that. We can't 
um, have all the onus on us and we can't set unreasonable expectations. We need to empower and give responsibility to our citizens. Um, so I won't set a target date until I get research commissioned and uh, the research I've commissioned completed in the summer and the Citizens Assembly completed in September. Um, if I can take the question about, um, um, although we do obviously set other targets, um, if I can take the question about how do we roll out this, this knowledge, I think it's such an important question. Um, it's crucial. I mean, if I give one example of Southampton, you know, it's a city it's a council which has got its own unique problem, which is around ports and the ship industry and um, cruise ships coming in. Uh, you know, they've got a green city charter where they're installing onshore um, power, uh, clean power, which is going to make a really big difference. Um, they have a very different set of experiences, but equally there'll be other coastal cities that have the same experiences that need to learn from them. Um, I think we're really lucky in local government circles to have um, networks like UK 100, um, uh, which is led a very, very brilliantly by somebody called Polly Billington with a deep understanding of local government, um, who convenes a lot of the key cities and you know, what you might describe as the kind of underperforming cities to come together to share knowledge um, in really private settings. And Jim and I actually had an experience about two weeks ago in Parliament on one of the many, many crises days in Parliament where MPs were sort of voting on this or that option. Um, and we were trying as best as we could to communicate what we wanted from the local government and the energy system point of view. And we just had MPs checking Twitter in front of us or rushing out to vote. You know, we can share network, we can share knowledge between us, but we need to be recognising that actually we need to crack on faster because there's a climate emergency, but also government is distracted. Um, and then I think the, the other thing that I probably want to say around uh, networks, and the final thing is that, um, frankly, within a council, things get done. Um, I'm, I'm sure you would agree with this. If there's a political drive and energy behind them, officers, uh, you know, accept lower pay to be in the public service uh, of, the, of their city and their community because they deeply care about their communities. What they need are their councillors to step up and to encourage them to do even more, even better, even faster. And I think if you've got councillors within, within each authority who are going to bang the drum for the climate agenda, who are going to have sharp elbows and try and really focus down resources and priorities, um, and then you've got those people coming together, that's going to be one of the fastest ways that you can try and accelerate uh, local government working to tackle our climate crisis. Emma, any thoughts on spreading the word? Um, and, um, I think that's been covered pretty well. I'd say from the community side, uh, engage with your councillors and MPs and support them as individuals, whether you're academics, business people, unless we're telling our politicians that this is important, they are going to get distracted by other issues and there are a lot of issues out there right now. Um, and also, and I know I sound like a broken record, but community energy groups are such powerful advocates in your community. Um, so make sure that they are able to link up with the local authority and other organisations. And they're there waiting to kind of work with you to bring communities along on this journey. So do make sure that community energy organisations are engaged. Sarah, any thoughts? Uh, just to sort of... Uh, responding to the question on carbon neutrality um, so we're right in the beginning really of understanding what carbon neutrality uh, means to us um, as a pathway and the activity we need to undertake um, but what I'm very interested in at the moment is the approach we need to take in the organisation to get to carbon <coughs> neutrality um, so um, a lot of the work we've delivered at the moment um, has been an add-on really to our business as usual very successful and very successful in reducing emissions uh, but we really need to be turning that on, our he on its head um, and ensuring that we're embedding um, this conversation about carbon all the way through from our policy position uh, to our planning, to our building, to our maintaining. Um, so what's going to make it happen? Um, huge change in approach. Um, there are areas um, that run in um, tandem with cost reduction. So obviously deep demand reduction um, for power um, is likely to have a big, uh, strong business case for us. Other areas um, where we know at the moment the technology just doesn't exist. So um, HGVs in our fire service will be a challenge um, for us. Um, the issue around heat, where we have um, 300 buildings, so we have kind of very diffuse um, loads of heat um, uh, across our buildings, again, will be a challenge. Um, so it's not only about the approach we need to take to engage across our organisation, um, it's building on some of those partnerships we're already creating or working with in the county. Um, we've been a strong supporter of uh, the Hydrogen Hub, um, who are looking at the role of hydrogen in the county, and we'd be interested to look at whether that's got a role in our HGV vehicles. Um, some of the information that comes out of the mapping project through LEO 
uh, might also give us some insights into whether um, our buildings uh, can form part of a bigger network around heat. Um, so it's certainly the case that we don't know all the answers around carbon neutrality, um, but we do have the leadership there. Um, it's important to say we're looking at our own footprint and not the county, so we're looking at um, what's within our direct control. Um, and in a year's time, I'll be able to give you more of an update um, about what, you know, what that really looks like as a pathway for us. Um, three more questions, and seven hands go up. Um, gentleman at the back, gentleman right at the front, and the lady on this side. No, uh, the red jacket, sorry. I didn't see your hand until you spoke. To be fair, I can only just see past your row anyway um, without my glasses. So um, the people at the back are definitely um, disadvantaged. Um, hi, uh, Jeff Hardy from Imperial College and also the new Energy Revolution Research Consortium. Very much looking, looking forward to working with projects like LEO and the, um, the Energy Hub as well. Um, we're, in my part of the project, we're looking at policy and regulation um, for local energy. So what would really help us shortcut um, some of our thinking is if maybe you could give us some in insight into what is your biggest headache in policy and regulation? What would you most like changed? And also, what change would you most like to see um, in there? And that will give us some um, shortcutting on maybe some of our thinking. Gentleman at the front here. I think it was... Thank you. John Cape from iPower. We're a social enterprise that develops low carbon projects. We are doing a lot of work in solar PV, fuel cells, other technologies and new business models. Feed-in tariff ended last month. What is the panel's views on um, the prospects for post-subsidy solar in particular um, in terms of their own programs and whether it's viable now, later or what kind of project types it may be viable for? Go, we'll go down the road one at a time for all three questions so you can say as much or as little about any of them as you like. Hello, Sarah James from UK Research and Innovation and also the UKIRK Energy Data Centre. Um, Greta Thunberg pulled up the UK government yesterday on the fact that the emissions that they are looking at and cutting do not include imports, aviation or shipping, um, which pretty much halves per head of population are carbon emissions. What carbon emissions are you looking at and do you think you should be looking at? I mean, is it our direct emissions here or are you also looking at the emissions that have gone into things like goods and services? Well, and just, for, just for a change, we'll start at Sarah's <coughs> end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I missed question two, so I, I may not have any comment on that. The role of solar okay. um, Headaches in policy and regulation. So... Um, uh, I suppose the only comment I'd like to make on that, and I think I'd probably speak for all of the Oxfordshire authorities, is greater clarity from government on the opportunities for low carbon within the planning system. Um, I think that's a big grey area at the moment. There's a lot of um, will to be highly ambitious um, within the county, um, but we're all interested in what can get through the inspectorate. Um, so that would be my ask on that front. Um, Post-subsidy solar... Um, I think Leo offers a great opportunity um, for us to look at, and that's specifically really what that project is about, to look at how um, renewables now stack up in the context of balancing supply and demand. Um, and goods and services, in terms of what we're looking at um, in footprinting, um, we have a sort of formal footprint for our estate that is looking at our direct emissions. Um, but I think what uh, our acknowledgement of a carbon neutrality uh, target means, I mean, that really looks at our direct emissions, but also the principle of it now flows through into um, other areas of our work. So we're very interested in looking at our supply chain. Um, I had a conversation with Carbon Trust the other day about how we do that in an empirical fashion, and actually it's something very difficult to get a grip on. Um, but um, it, it doesn't mean we can't start, and it doesn't mean we can't take a view on where our highest impact supply chain is. Um, and part of, I think, sort of setting some of these um, uh, ambitious targets starts to speak to our supply chain about the kind of things we're going to need to be seeing in two years, five years, ten years. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I would definitely echo the point around um, certainty and the lack thereof as a headache. Um, 
because uh, as with the point I was making earlier around the real importance of leveraging the largest amount of money and recognising that that is concentrated within private finance, we need for private finance to know what is happening. <laughs> they absolutely need that certainty before they're going to invest. And I recognise that government's attention is split um, in lots of different directions right now. And I can recognise the challenge that is facing the civil service. But if there's one thing we can really push forward, apart from give us more money, it's uh, give us more certainty. Um, and I really welcome thinking and insights into how we as a local authority can try to prompt government to do that. Um, on the question of solar, um, I don't think I've got much more to add, except for um, Claire Perry yesterday, um, you know, slightly concerned me by saying that she, um, she was seeing the, the significant drop in uh, price for PV down, uh, coming down to the changes that are happening in China and Germany, um, which potentially suggests to me there's not any sort of future alternative arrangement coming in, which would be unfortunate. Um, um, and I'll be keeping a keen, out, keen eye out to see what happens there. But there's some really exciting stuff happening, and just to kind of build on the question earlier around how do cities connect, um, not to give too many examples from Southampton, but there's a chief, uh, they have a chief scientist um, who has um, got a research project which has mapped every single roof in Southampton and has been able to determine, using some quite clever techniques, exactly which roofs he could put solar panels on and at what cost and how much it would save over what time frame. And that's just really exciting. If that could be spun out to more local um, authorities, that could be really helpful. And then um, on the question of um, what do you measure, well, uh, you, you kind of value what you measure, and you measure what you value. Um, and so as a council, one of the reasons I'm resisting having a uh, carbon neutrality target is because it creates perverse incentives. So to give an example, I think my council could be probably carbon neutral next year if we got rid of council housing. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> We're not going to do that. Um, equally, we've got um, Oxford Direct Services, the social enterprise, which has got um, a really significant transportation carbon footprint, but we've got a lot of um, work underway and funding to actually reduce that through electrification. Um, so we're in a situation where we've got the need to avoid perverse incentives by setting um, unachievable measures and targets, but equally we've got a situation where we've got a lot happening within Oxford and Oxfordshire, which we've really got to get our head around and have an evaluation framework built into, as you were saying earlier, um, and that's going to be a key point for us to start developing what our measures and targets will be. But at what point do you stop? At what point does all the flurry of activity stop sufficiently for you to actually set those targets? Um, policy and regulation, Jeff, uh, just one. Um, yeah, I echo in terms of stability, complexity, such a huge issue, not only, particularly with regulation, not only just getting your head around the one consultation, but how that interacts with the other and how they all implicate and interact. And it's hard enough for people who are kind of doing this as paid full time, <coughs> let alone for people doing it on a volunteer basis. Um, but also social value, um, how we can evidence with Ofgem and Bayes, but particularly Ofgem social value of energy systems would be really helpful. Post subsidies, solar, um, in terms of the community energy field, rooftop solar isn't that far off really. In some cases, as long as you get kind of matching demand and so on, um, we're quite a long way off in terms of the other technologies, I would say, within the sector. Local Energy Scotland's just done a really useful report on this. I think it's on our website. If not, we can send you a link that maps out feasibility of all technologies without subsidies against different IRRs and so on. Um, and carbon emissions within community sector, obviously, it's more localised, but I do think we need to th be thinking more about where things are coming from because within community energy, we're very much focused on in local environmental impact, but it's quite hard to think about kind of where our solar panels are coming from. And I, I used to be a practitioner, and when I tried to track back where the cells are coming from and all the other things are coming from, it's really, really difficult. So kind of looking at the wider environmental impact of what we do, um, we should be focusing on that a little bit more. David? Mm, regulation, yeah. Um, okay, uh, so two asks really, I guess. One, um, can we have a, a regulatory system that supports the decentralised system? That would be one. Um, and, um, which may give you a hint as to what I think it does at the moment. Um, <laughs> and sorry, Patrick. Uh, and the other one is, and I'm sorry about this as well. Um, I think uh, it would be nice if, if, if Ofgem were given the direction that they should consider the future consumer cost, not just the current. I'd like, I'd like to see the calculation. <laughs> um, 
So uh, solar, I would absolutely agree with, with Emma. We, we certainly are putting solar still onto some roofs, but it needs an off-taker sat there who's taking pretty much all of that power. Um, you can kind of make it fly with a battery. That kind of depends on Ofgem's review, though. So, as I say, decentralised system support would be nice to see that consistency. Um, I understand from my lawyer friends that they um, are seeing the large-scale stuff come back as well. Where the really significantly large solar farms are, are going as well. Um, nothing else, though. Um, and then, yeah, carbon emissions. That's such a tough one, particularly scope three. Um, because our climate emergency included scope three. Wow. <laughs> well, I didn't vote for it. It was, <laughs> it was full council. Full council pushed that one through. So that's, I mean, it, it, huge. Do know what they were voting for? Um, no comment. Um, <laughs> hugely challenging. I mean, what do you ask people to do in terms of consumption? Um, because you are relying on other countries decarbonising as well. I mean, that's, we have to encourage them to do it. Um, circular economy is a big theme in Bristol at the moment. Can we actually re reuse some of the things that we are currently throwing away? So there's a really, you know, we're in the fortunate position that we run the waste company as well. So uh, in Bristol, so they have a big role to play in that. And so we're starting to see new initiatives come through. And I'm the wrong person to ask the detail about those because it's really not my area. Um, but I'm aware that they're doing it. Um, so it's there are multiple actions we can do to start to impact on the consumption of the city. Mm. Obviously, we have far more control over the more direct emissions. So, you know, where do we prioritise, I guess, is the question. And that's a, you know, very much a debate that should be had, for sure. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the questions. Um, some of them slightly tougher than others. Um, thank you to the panel. Uh, could I ask you to thank the panel in the traditional way? Um, I think uh, not wanting to steal the last word but taking the chair's prerogative to do so I think that um, the conversation here has shown that there is, a, there is a will and an opportunity but there is a huge, huge amount still to do um, and a number of things that were talked about hinted at how you integrate this into a wider social fabric into the transport strategies, the waste strategies, the housing strategies, the planning strategies, all the things that councils actually have statutory powers over, rather than seeing it as climate change or energy, which national government has powers over. And how we do that over the next 18 months, two years, however long, um, not just here, but it's, it's that that I think is the knowledge share that comes out of this. Because if every council has the ability to in get in embed it across those strategies, then there is a genuine opportunity to move those agendas forward. You know, the social housing question, the social transport question, if those are designed and delivered with carbon in mind, that's a very different service and a very different proposal than you have now where a transport um, expert sitting there looking at the cheapest way to fuel those vehicles and move those vehicles around based solely on a traditional transport model um, would do so. So I think that is probably the biggest learning for me. So thank you very much indeed. Um, and I think we're all around for lunch if you've got other questions. Keith. Good to me. So thank you very much to Patrick. Thank you to all our panellists. Lunch will be back in the Ruth Deach building, which is where reception or the registration was. There's a room, I think, just off to the side there. Uh, we start again at 10 past one. That's a start rather than just starting to think about starting, I think. Um, and after lunch, we'll be splitting it into two places. So uh, one session on business models for local energy will be in this room. And the other session on whole systems will be in a seminar room that is just next to reception in the other building. So uh, thank you very much. Oh, so one thing I meant, meant to... Sorry, yes, you want to say something? Um, I was just going to ask if you could possibly get them to use less energy on the pooling system in this room. All right. <laughs> so we're looking at uh, our technical colleagues at the back. If we can turn the air con down. Thank you very much. That's a good point. Well presented. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention the fire alarms. I don't think we've got any fire alarms notified, but the... <laughs> 
Congress area is out on the green there where we kind of came across or went round and we're facing kind of going this way I think it's to the right just kind of past the park bench that's there so um, yeah sorry for forgetting that notes and let's enjoy lunch and thanks again to our panel <laughs>